Tonight on Nation to Nation, the Public Safety Committee is studying rural crime. Georgina Jollywalk testified to make sure Indigenous people don't shoulder the blame. The assumption is that it is the Indigenous youth who are committing these crimes, and to me that's misleading. The political panel debates climate change. A recent UN report says we only have 12 years to stop irreversible effects. We will never have a chance again to ensure our children live in a, in a world where temperature increases are held at a level that we can survive. Welcome to Nation and Nation. Hello, I'm Todd Lamaran. Earlier this month, the United Nations report came out on climate change, and it had an alarming conclusion. Greenhouse gases aren't cut nearly in half in 12 years. Climate change will be irreversible. Earlier this week, the House of Commons had an emergency debate on the issue. But what came out of it? To discuss climate change further, I'm joined by Parliamentary Secretary for Climate Change and, and the Environment, Sean Fraser. Welcome to Nation to Nation for your first time. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Our regular Conservative guest is Kathy McLeod, the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs. And we have Green Party leader Elizabeth May. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fraser, I'll start with you. Uh, uh, when you addressed the House during the emergency debate, you talked a lot about a price on pollution as a solution. How is this price on pollution going to reduce carbon emissions in 12 years. Uh, thanks very much for the question. It's, it's a very important one and I want to be clear that uh, it's not a one-trick pony. Uh, we're, we're not going to solve the, the problems that were raised in the IPCC report uh, with one simple measure, uh, but the price on pollution is one major pillar of our plan to help protect the environment and combat climate change. Essentially what it boils down to, and I think if we take a step back we can acknowledge that Canadians understand pollution is bad. Uh, it's free to pollute in Canada today. Uh, we're going to change that. We're going to make it more expensive to pollute and to the extent there's revenues generated by a price paid on pollution, that money is going to be returned to families to make life more affordable for them and at the same time hopefully see emissions come down. Uh, Ms. McLeod, your reaction to what you just heard? You know, I think we have a serious issue that we have to deal with, there's no question. Um, Canada obviously can't deal with it as 1.6 percent of the carbon emissions. We can't deal with it in isolation from, you know, the heavy emitters such as China and other countries. Where we perhaps have disagreement is how to move forward and, you know, certainly the carbon pricing. You know, I look at British Columbia and when the Liberals talk revenue neutral, um, I think a lot of people hold British Columbia up as an example and with a slash of the pen the new government in British Columbia turned what was a carbon neutral tax into a ta basically a tax grab for general revenues for the new government. So I, I'm leery of this comment about revenue neutrality and so I think you know there's a lot of things that we need to look at but certainly the experts say the carbon pricing has to be like about 10 times significantly, significantly higher than what the government's proposing. So you're going to have the pain with no gain. Uh, talking about that pain though, shouldn't we be in the short term going through that pain if uh, what we're looking at is long term disaster? So what you're going to have is you're going to have carbon pricing which is going to be, especially our people in the north, there's nothing that's been done in terms of those diesel dependent communities. They're already dealing with extraordinary, extraordinary prices and again Canada being 1.6 percent of the emissions, um, you know, what will that carbon pricing do? It's not going to make, it's not going to be enough to actually make the difference. We need the, the U.S., we need China, we need India, we need these countries to be really looking at what they're doing. Uh, Ms. May, I believe in the debate you pointed out that uh, th three or four pages of the report, which is very long, it's hundreds of pages long, talks about carbon, uh, uh, carbon tax. Are we focusing too much on carbon taxes and pollution prices uh, to solve this problem? Well, absolutely, and I couldn't agree more with Sean. It's, the government isn't saying that the carbon price alone will do what needs to be done, but we also have to look at our target. Right now, our target's the same one that was put in place by the previous government of Stephen Harper, and it's inconsistent with, we knew this before the IPCC report, but the IPCC recent report is saying it's much more urgent than we thought it was even when we met in Paris in 2015. We need, to, in order to hit the target that's in the Paris Accord of ensuring that our global average temperature doesn't go above 1.5 degrees Celsius of what global average temperature was before the Industrial Revolution, we have to, as you said in your intro, make a much steeper slashing of greenhouse gases, much faster. And by the way, the IPCC report 
also talks about the importance of indigenous knowledge. There's a, this is a very long, lengthy, and detailed review, like a massive peer review. In Canada, we have this political football. As, as you said, we're spending much too much time just talking about one measure, one instrument. We have to, we have to get our east-west electricity grid up so that we can ensure that we can sell across provinces renewable energy into the provinces that don't have it. And to Kathy's point, I couldn't agree more, there are isolated communities dependent on diesel. Well, right now there are literally hundreds of First Nations across Canada that are in the forefront of innovating with renewables. And we need to actually engage more Indigenous communities and First Nations in having the, you know, the we're getting off fossil fuels fast plan, that they can then export that energy to other places, uh, sell to larger communities outside, and have a revenue generating renewable industry uh, right across the country, but grounded in uh, benefits to First Nations communities that actually, since we're on their land, we ought to be thinking constructively about reconciliation and climate action in the same kinds of measures. Uh, how do you do this, though, uh, without, I'm sure, ordinary Canadians are worried about higher prices, higher taxes, maybe losing their jobs. How do we do this without uh, kind of derailing the economy, though? I think ordinary Canadians, so-called, are extraordinary and not ordinary. And I don't think any of us want to write off our children's future. And this is not hyperbole. We run the risk of destroying human civilization in the near term, in the lifetimes of our children. If we don't grab the IPCC, recommended targets and the pathway to, sec to a secure future. It's not like 1.5 degrees Celsius is a safe landing zone. It is way safer than two, and two is way safer than three. And right now we're headed to three to four degrees increase in global average temperature on the basis of current government commitments. So China's doing more than we are. India's doing more than we are. Even the U.S. under Trump is still reducing emissions more than we are. So we can't sit back and say, we just have to wait to see everybody else do it. We better start showing some leadership. Uh, Ms. McLeod, is this kind of uh, talk about disasters and the end of civilization, is this hyperbole? Or uh, should we really be uh, doing something more uh, than even what the Liberal government is proposing. You know, we absolutely need to take this very seriously. I think um, I think ultimately technology is going to be our answer. I think, you know, the, the wisdom of uh, what we can do, how we do it, um, you know, I find it strange and, you know, our country, we're not using a whole lot more geothermal. You know, there's, there is technology, there is opportunities, and I think absolutely, you know, we need to focus on those opportunities. So again, some First Nations that are, you know, um, some of them are living in perfectly wonderful opportunities for a geothermal source of get off diesel, move to geothermal. So it's gonna cost some money, but I think those are gonna be some of the important solutions. Uh, Mr. Fraser, I'll uh, end this segment with you. Um, uh, some have criticized the Prime Minister uh, kind of disappearing during all this. Uh, should he be stepping up to the plate more, especially on an issue so important? Uh, if anybody's had the opportunity to speak with him personally, there's, there's hardly an issue that's more important to him. Uh, it's obvious that during the last campaign we, we talked a great deal about the, the need to uh, protect a, a healthy environment and a strong economy at the same time. And just to, to revisit the, the point that you raised with uh, my colleague Ms. May, uh, about the, the need to sort of address this and avoid any kind of an economic uh, disaster. Uh, if you look at the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, that was just uh, announced uh, about a week ago, uh, Professor Nordhaus from Yale University uh, was uh, received the award because he uh, identified strategies to, to essentially communicate to the world that you can't have a plan to grow the economy without considering the environmental impacts. Uh, right now, we're, we're moving forward with a plan that's actually going to marry the two concepts and say our economic security depends on a healthy environment, as does the security of every person who lives in Canada. I'm proud to work alongside the Prime Minister and, and particularly in this portfolio because I know it's a major priority for him and for the government. Okay, we'll uh, talk more about this, but it's time for a short break, but we'll be back with our panel. Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion that follows the House's emergency debate on climate change that happened earlier this week. Uh, Ms. May, I'm going to start with you. Uh, in this round and uh, I know you stood up a couple of times in the House during the debate and asked for nonpartisanship and not to be scoring political points. I don't think that happened though from what I observed. Um, so how are we going to get the political will to do anything about this? 
Yeah, it, it was a debate that did sink into some of the usual partisan talking points, which was disappointing, although I have to say a lot of MPs from all sides of the House really addressed the science. So how do we get people to talk about, here's a, you know, it's, it's 800 pages, it's a, it digests 6,000 different scientific reports from all around the world to one document designed for politicians, and yet I'm sure those of us who read it find, okay, this, is, this isn't easy reading, it's not light reading, it's digested for non-scientists to understand it. I'd say anybody should be prepared to go on a, find it on a website, start reading it. In order to have a nonpartisan debate, we have to focus on what matters. And what matters is that we have solid, incontrovertible evidence that if we don't move in the next couple of years, we will never have a chance again to ensure our children live in a, in a world where temperature increases are held at a level that we can survive. That's the bottom line. That's what we've been told. And nothing can be more important than that. So that means we have to get our ducks in a row and figure out if this is the target, how do we work together? I'd love to see an all-party committee that did nothing but say, okay, let's, let's figure this out. Let's do it in a nonpartisan way so that it's not a political football. It's what we decide to do. Like I love the expression in French, le projet de société. We need a real sense that this is our project as Canadians and we're going to get it right. Uh, Ms. McLeod, what do you think? Do you think this can become a nonpartisan issue? Because it, it, it didn't sound like it to, I think, ordinary Canadians. You know, I think what we need to do is hear the different perspectives from the different parties and, and truly try to understand it. So, you know, when you know, I talk about people in the north and what this is going to do, carbon pricing to their food, and my concerns about British Columbia and how, you know, revenue neutral change, you know, I want people like, um, you know, the Green Party and the Liberals and the NDP to, to hear those concerns so that we end up in a place that is better. So. Um, I think it always in a political environment is a challenge, but I think, you know, someone said it would be, it's important sometimes to have a plan that stands the tests of different governments, but so it would be a challenge, absolutely. I think, you know, obviously the first step is, is things like the debate the other night, but really trying to listen to what people say, because it comes from the heart when we're worried about what people's, you know, what, I mean, a small carbon price, which is really what's being proposed, is going to have significant impact. There's nothing my office gets more emails on than when the price of gas hits a, you know, 150 a litre. We know that really the effectiveness is about $12 a litre. You could correct me on that, but like hugely astronomically different. My son in Vancouver has very easy choices. He doesn't drive a car. He lives in Vancouver. It's easy. But if you live in uh, remote communities, rural communities, these things have a much, much bigger impact. Uh, I'm just going to stay with you, Ms. McLeod. I mean, I think one of your colleagues, and you mentioned it uh, earlier, that, uh, uh, you know, why should we really go f full into this when other countries like China or India or the United States aren't on board? Uh, shouldn't uh, Canada be seen as an example, though? We need, we need to do our part. We certainly need to do our part, but we also need to recognize that you know, with our contribution to the emissions, um, we can't you know put people's um, you know for example, and this is where we could have a longer debate today. The Trans Mountain Pipeline, um, those are issues where you know the Liberal government thinks you can hit a balance. I know that my colleague to the right believes that it's absolutely the wrong thing to do. So, so those are the conversations that we need to have. Uh, speaking of Trans Mountain, the expansion of the pipeline. Um, I mean, in light of this report and how dire it seems, uh, should the Canadian government have been investing in this? Isn't this something that maybe should be cancelled outright? So uh, my own perspective and this perspective of the government is that we can move forward with the development of our, our natural resources, but we have to do it in a responsible way. Uh, with respect to the conversation about expanding our energy infrastructure and the impact that's going to have on our commitments internationally, I think it's essential that uh, if we're expanding our energy infrastructure, it's part of a bigger plan that's uh, designed to have our, our total emissions come down. And we also have to have a plan in place to deal with the potential environmental risks. Uh, in particular, I'll, I'll point to the Oceans Protection Plan that's designed to make sure that we have a world-class uh, spill prevention and spill response strategy. And I know that reasonable people can disagree on this, uh, but if we're going to uh, develop our natural resources and to try to get a fair price for it, I I'm okay with that as long as it's part of a bigger plan to ensure we're acting responsibly when it comes to the bigger picture of protecting our environment. 
Uh, Ms. May, uh, should uh, the energy sector be developed at all then? Uh, for example, the, the huge First Nations support, for example, for the liquefied natural gas project up in northern BC. I think what we have to do is, first of all, as I was saying earlier, we have to look at the science. If, it, if you can figure out how to cut your emissions by 45 percent below 2010 levels by 2030 and still go ahead with one of these mega projects, please show me the numbers of how you do that. The reality is that we can develop our energy sector because our energy sector is more than fossil fuels. Our energy sector is the solar panel arrays that are being put in place in First Nations communities, uh, tidal and wind offshore, as well as, as Kathy was saying, geothermal. We have tremendous potential in energy and in our fossil fuel resources we have to recognize that most of it will have to be left in the ground. So the question is how much can be uh, developed, for instance, of bitumen? What do we do with the bitumen from the oil sands? What I've been advocating and the Green Party's been advocating is let's upgrade and refine it in Alberta and have it replace the Saudi and Venezuelan and Kazakhstan and Nigerian oil that we take into eastern Canada so that we could actually have per barrel of bitumen produced far more jobs in Canada but on a declining basis of production. And the Alberta climate plan at the moment, they call it a climate plan, but it's going from 70 megatons a year to 100 megatons a year. Well, that won't wash with going down dramatically. So it's, it's a matter of being, and I do agree that we, should, we can find ways, I believe we can find ways to ensure that no region and no province's economy is badly damaged or even damaged by going towards the right targets. But the LNG at Kitimat is one where the massive increase in greenhouse gases is due to the fact that it's natural gas but not natural, if you know what I mean, it's, it's fracked. And fracking natural gas makes it as carbon heavy as coal. So there's like the argument is we keep being told, well, it's going to go to China and it replace coal. The, the atmosphere doesn't care. There's one atmosphere. And the emissions from fracked LNG mean the same pulse of carbon to the atmosphere as if China was still burning coal. Okay, I'll stop you there, but I want to get one last word from Ms. McLeod. Uh, would the Conservatives ever support that, support to keeping the fossil fuels in the ground? Um, Quite frankly, we've been supporting the Trans Mountain Pipeline. We support things like energy. I agree that it would be, um, rather than having oil coming down the St. Lawrence Seaway and tankers from, you know, Venezuela, from Saudi Arabia, for Canadians to get their resources and be more self-sustaining within their own market. I see that there will be a transition away, but I think it's going to take some time. And, you know, certainly we will be presenting a plan for 2019 in terms of what our movement forward would be. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to Mr. Shear's plan on that. I know a lot of Canadians are. I want to thank you all for joining me. Uh, but it's time for another break. And when we come back, NDP MP Georgina Jollyball, Jollybois will be here to talk about her appearance for the Public Safety Committee study on rural crime. Welcome back. This week, the Committee on Public Safety looked at rural crime. It's based on a motion brought by Conservative MP Shannon Stubbs. She wants the committee to study what she believes is a rise in crime affecting rural residents, giving rise to the perception they're no longer safe. Earlier this week, NDP MP Georgina Jollybois was a witness. Here's a small sample. This motion that came forward to the House of Commons uh, was because of the, the outcome of the Colton Bushi family situation. That's my understanding and many Canadians understanding across Canada. I want to be clear again, I'm not interested in having discussions where the lives of First Nations, Métis and Inuit are further at risk. Join me now is Georgina Jollybois. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you very much. Merci Dyson-Nesa. Why did you appear before the committee? I've specifically requested to appear as a witness before the committee because they're talking a very, about a very crucial issue, rural crime. And I wanted to clarify some points because of the, con of the assumptions att attached to rural crime and that uh, the assumptions are misleading and I wanted to help clarify some points. 
Uh, what is that assumption? I mean, was the elephant in the room, and I, I know it's kind of got danced around. I was there, I watched it. Uh, uh, the death of Colton Bushy at the hands of Gerald Stanley, is that what we're talking about? I think, again, the, my understanding is this. When they're talking about crime and criminal activity, the assumption is that it is the indigenous youth who are committing these crimes. And to me, that's misleading. The crime statistics that are released every year, the, the property crime may be on, on the increase in rural area, but it, the numbers are not as high as they would be in other municipalities throughout the riding, or throughout Canada, for that matter. And the assumption is that uh, the communities, the municipalities and the reserves aren't doing anything to help promote public safety and keep communities safe. Uh, now, again, as I said earlier, I, I did attend this committee meeting for most of it. Mm -hmm. I noticed that it felt like there was a bit of uh, tension or whatever. With some of the questions that you were being asked, uh, uh, what was up with that? I have no idea. I don't know what they were thinking. But to be asked about the funding formula and the funding, it's the Liberal government who is in power and it's the Liberal government who, who looks after the, the finances and they're the ones that have the answer. I'm not part of their government. I am a sitting MP. And for them to ask such questions is unfair to us because in Saskatchewan or the rest of Canada, there are various, uh, various levels of funding required for policing. The federal RCMP requires funding to uh, to hire and to recruit and to, uh, to have detachments and police officers in communities throughout Canada as well as Saskatchewan. Municipal services require on the provincial funding who uh, the federal government will provide funding for, I would assume would provide funding for municipal police service. Even municipal police services are asking in Saskatoon, for example, it was in the news, they want an increase in their budget for policing. And the point I wanted to make regarding in the, for example, within Day Smith and Mississippi Churchill River riding, the RCMP, the resources they're talking about, if there's a unit about, for example, the Highway Traffic Act, it could be situated in North Battleford, and then the idea is that they're responsible to not only to the region, but to the entire North District. And if there's a unit of only 10, they have to go throughout the whole north and do their operations. To me, and they're talking about that, that they would require assistance on that. And then municipalities and reserves are also asking for crime reduction uh, funds to, to tackle some of the community initiatives. So funding at various levels and indigenous people promote working relationship with the police and it's really important to have that relationship with the police in the communities. Uh, well we'll have to see what happens with this committee. I want to thank you for taking some thank time you. to talk to me. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's it uh, for our show for another week but if you missed any part of it or any other episode check out our podcast. Go to abtnnews.ca slash podcast. I'm Todd Lamarand. Thanks for watching.